So now we begin on four classes on number theory. The purpose of taking it up now is that we're still practicing proofs and number theory is a, a nice uh, self-contained elementary subject as we'll treat it, which has some quite elegant uh, proofs and illustrates contradiction and other uh, structure structures that we've learned about. A little bit of induction and definitely some applications of the well-ordering principle. Uh, the ultimate punchline of the whole unit is to understand the RSA crypto system and how it works. Along the way, we will today actually establish uh, one of those mother's milk facts that we all take for granted about unique factorization of integers into primes. Uh, but in fact, that's a theorem that merits some proof uh, as an example in the homework shows where we exhibited a system of numbers which didn't factor uniquely. And finally, we will uh, be able to knock off the diehard story once and for all. So let's begin by stating the rules of the game. Um, we're going to assume all of the usual algebraic rules for addition and multiplication and subtraction. So you may know some of these rules have names, like the first equality is called distributivity of multiplication over plus, of times over plus, and then the second uh, rule here is called commutativity of multiplication. And uh, here are some more familiar rules. This is called associativity of multiplication. This is called the additive identity, a minus a is zero, or actually additive inverse, zero is the additive identity and minus a is the inverse of a. Um, a plus zero equals a is the definition of uh, zero being an additive identity. a plus one is greater than a. So these are all standard algebraic facts that we're gonna take for granted and not worry about. And one more fact that we also know um, and we're gonna take as an axiom, um, if I uh, divide a number, a positive number, uh, sorry, if I divide a number a by a positive number b, then when we're talking about integers, uh, what I'm going to get is a quotient and a remainder. What's the definition of the quotient and a remainder? Well, um, the division theorem says that if I divide uh, a by b, that means if I take the quotient times b plus the remainder, I get a. And in fact, there's a unique quotient of a divided by b, and this unique remainder of a divided by b, where the remainder, uh, what makes it unique is the remainder is constrained to be uh, in the interval greater than or equal to zero and less than the divisor b. So we're going to take this uh, fact for granted too. Um, proving it is not worth thinking about too hard because it's one of those facts that's so elementary that it's hard to think of other things that uh, would more legitimately prove it. I'm sure it could be proved by induction, but I haven't really thought that through. Okay, um, a key uh, relation that we're gonna be looking at today uh, is the relation of divisibility between uh, integers. So by the way, all of the variables for the next week or so are gonna be understood to range over the integers. So when I say number, I mean integer. When I talk about variables a and c and k, I mean that they're taking integer values. So I'm going to define c divides a using this vertical bar notation. It's read as divide. c divides a if and only if um, a is equal to k times c for some k. Um, and there are a variety of synonyms for a divides b, like uh, a is a... Uh, 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 a divides C, uh, sorry, C divides A um, is to say that A is a multiple of C um, and C is a divisor of A. Okay, let's just practice this. So 5 divides 15, well, because 15 is 3 times 5. Um, a number n divides 0, every number n divides 0, even 0 divides 0 because 0 is equal to 0 times n. So um, zero is a multiple of every number. Um, another trivial fact that follows from the definition is that if C divides A, then C divides any constant times A. Well, let's just check that out, how it follows from the definition. Um, 
if I'm given that C divides A, that means that A is equal to K prime C for some K prime. That implies that um, if I multiply both sides of this equality by S, I get that SA is equal to SK prime C. And if I parenthesize the SK prime, I can call that to be K. And I found, sure enough, that SA is a multiple of C. That's a trivial proof. We're just practicing with the definitions. Um, so we have just verified this fact that if C divides A, then C divides a constant times A. Um, as a matter of fact, if C divides A and C divides B, then C divides A plus B. Let's just check that one. Um, what we've got is C, uh, C divides A means that, um, uh, that uh, A is equal to K1 times C. And uh, C divides B means that B is equal to K2 times C. So that means that A plus B is simply K1 plus K2 times C, where what I've done is here is used the uh, distributivity uh, law to factor C out and use the fact that multiplication is commutative so I can factor out on either side. Okay, um, let's put those facts together. If C divides A and C divides B, then C divides SA plus TB where s and t are any integers at all. So a combination of two numbers a and b like this uh, uh, is called a linear combination of a and b, an integer linear combination. But since we're only talking about integers, I'm going to stop saying integer linear combination and just say linear combination. A linear combination of a and b is what you get by uh, uh, multiplying them by coefficients s and t and adding them. OK. Uh, so we've just figured out that, in fact, if C divides A and C divides B, then C divides an integer linear combination of B. When C divides two numbers, it's called a common divisor of those two numbers. So we could rephrase this observation by saying common divisors of A and B divide integer linear combinations of A and B, which is a good fact to just file away in your head. Now. What we're going to be focusing on for the rest of today is the concept of the greatest common divisor of A and B, called the GCD of A and B. Um, the greatest common divisor of A and B uh, exists by the well-ordering principle because uh, it's a set of non-negative integers with an upper bound. Um, namely, A is an upper bound on the greatest common divisor of A and B. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, as we did in an exercise, uh, or I think in the text, that implies that there will be a greatest one among all the common divisors, assuming there are any, um, but one is always a common divisor, so there, there are guaranteed to be some. Um, let's look at some examples. Um, the greatest common divisor of 10 and 12, you can check, it's 2. Uh, mainly because the 10 factors into 2 times 5 and 12 factors into uh, 2 times 6, and the 6 and the 5 have no common factors, so the only one that they share is 2. Uh, the GCD of 13 and 12 is 1. They have no common factors in, uh, in common. You can see that because 13 is a prime, and so uh, it has no uh, factors other than 1 and 13, and 13 doesn't divide 12 because it's too big, so it's got to be 1. The GCD of 17 and 17 is 17. That's a general phenomenon. The GCD of n and n is always n. The greatest common divisor of 0 and n uh, is equal to n for any positive n. That's because um, uh, uh, n is going to be a common divisor of 0 and n because everything divides n. Uh, and of course, you can't have a, uh, a common divisor of n that's bigger than n, assuming that n is positive. So now we come to a key property of GCD that's called the remainder lemma. And it says the following. If b is not 0, then the greatest common divisor of a and b is, in fact, the greatest common divisor of b and the remainder of a divided by b. Well, it might take a moment to think about that, but probably just proving it will make it clearer. Okay, uh, Let's look at 
um, the division theorem applied to A divided by B. So A is equal to a quotient times B plus the remainder. Well, the point is that if you look at any two of those terms and you look at a common divisor of them, that is, if you look at a divisor, for example, of A and QB, um, then it's also going to be a divisor of R because that means that uh, A plus QB is a linear, A minus QB is a linear combination of A and QB, and if there's a common divisor of A and QB, then it's a divisor of R. In particular, if I have a common divisor of A and B, uh, it is also necessarily a common divisor, a, a divisor of R, which means it's a common divisor of B and R. Um, and conversely, if I have a common divisor of B and R, then it's obviously a divisor of A. So the point is that these two expressions, the, the GCD of A and B and the GCD of B and the remainder of A and B, um, uh, the A and B have the same common divisors as B and the remainder of A and B. And since those two pairs of numbers have the same set of common divisors, they clearly have the same greatest common divisor. And that's the proof. Um, you should maybe stop for a moment and think about that because it's easy but important. Now the importance of it is that it's going to give us a simple and really quite efficient way to figure out how to compute the GCD. The point is if you look at, this, uh, at what's going on here, here I have an A and a B, and here I have a B and a number that is the remainder of A divided by B, which means it's smaller than B. So if we think of, of B as the smaller of A and B, which it generally will be if you're going to divide uh, A by B, then the numbers here have gotten smaller in both coordinates compared to the numbers there. And we're making progress. If we keep applying this rule again and again, we're eventually going to get down to small numbers where luckily, if we're lucky, one of them is going to be zero. The other one will have to be the remainder. Let's watch that in action, okay? Um, so uh, let A be 899 and B be 493. And let's calculate the greatest common divisor of A and B. Well, according to the remainder lemma, the GCD of 899 and 493 is equal to what I get by taking the remainder of uh, the, the GCD of 493 and the remainder of 899 divided by 493. Well, the quotient is 1, so it's really just subtracting 493 from 899. And what I get is that the first GCD of 899 and 493 is the same as the GCD of 493 and 406. Now, the GCD of 493 and 406 is the same as the GCD of 406 and the remainder of 493 divided by 406, which is 406 and 87. And again, the GCD of 406 and 87 is, uh, the, uh, is the GCD of 87 and the remainder of 406 divided by 87. You can check that that's 87 and 58. Um, GCD of 87 and 58 is the GCD of 58 and 87 divided by 58 remainder, which is 29. And now, interestingly enough, um, uh, the GCD of uh, 29 and 58 is the GCD of 29 and 0 because 29 uh, divides 58 with no remainder. And of course, we know that the GCD of 29 and 0 is 29, and that's the punchline. I've just figured out that the GCD of 899 and 493 is 29 by a very simple iterative procedure of just constantly uh, replacing numbers by remainders. Okay, um, now we come to the key uh, theorem and property of GCDs, which uh, will take a little bit uh, of proof and, uh, and another good idea. And that is that the GCD of A and B is actually an integer linear combination of A and B. And in other words, the um, GCD of A and B is equal to SA plus TB for some, in, for some numbers S and T. Um, and so the, 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 that's what it means to say that the GCD is a linear combination of A and B. How am I going to prove this? Well, there's a various ways, but the most sensible and direct way that will actually be useful to us is I'm going to show you how to find S and T from A and B. And 
uh, here's how. Basically, the method is to apply the, <coughs> the Euclidean algorithm, as we just did, that is continually taking remainders. But as you go, you keep updating. The remainder itself is a linear combination of A and B, and that means that you're, uh, each time you're taking linear combinations of linear combinations, which are linear combinations. And the result is that if you update step by step, then at each step you will have the current remainder uh, expressed as a linear combination of A and B, and eventually that remainder is going to be the remainder uh, of the remainder that is followed by a remainder of zero, which means it is the GCD, and then you've got the answer expressed as the desired linear combination. So let's look at how that works explicitly with, the, with an example. So let's see how this works out with an example. Um, and let's look at those numbers. A is 899 and B is 493 again. But this time, as we proceed to perform the Euclidean algorithm, we're going to keep track of some coefficients of linear combinations. So the first step in um, the Euclidean algorithm is you divide A by B and take the remainder. So 899 divided by 493 has a quotient of 1 and a remainder of 406. In other words, 899 is 1 times 493 plus 406, which means, of course, that the remainder 406 is simply gotten by taking um, uh, 1 times 89 plus minus 493. Um, and I've expressed automatically this remainder as a linear combination of 899 and 493, which is what I'm going to be trying to do at each step. Okay, next step is to divide 493 by 406 and take the remainder. So 493 has a quotient of 1 when divided by 406 and a remainder of 87. And that means that, again, the remainder 87 can be expressed as a linear combination of 493 and 406. It's 493 minus 1 times 406. But wait a minute. There's 406. It's 1 times 89 minus 1 times 493. So this 1 times 406 is going to contribute a coefficient of minus 1 for 899 and a coefficient of, uh, and a, of plus 1. 1, um, that is minus minus, for 493, and I'm going to wind up with twice 493 minus 1 eight, uh, times 899. And there it is, is that latest remainder, 87, is expressed as a linear combination of 899 and 493. Let's keep going. Okay, next step is divide 406 by 87 and take the remainder. So 406 divided by 87 has a quotient of 4 and a remainder of 58. So 58, again, is simply 406 minus 4 times 87. But wait, up here is 406 expressed as a linear combination of A and B. Here is 87 expressed as a linear combination of A and B. So combining the corresponding coefficients of A and B, I wind up with 58 expressed as a linear combination of A and B. There it is. 58 is 5 times 899 minus 9 times 493. Let's keep going. Same way, I'm supposed to now divide 87 by 58. I do that, I get a quotient of 1, a remainder of 29. So 87 is 1 times 58 plus 29, which means that 29 is a linear combination of 87 and 58. But wait a minute, I've got 58 and 87 expressed as linear combinations of A and B, and that means I can combine these two, combine their coefficients, and get 29 expressed as a linear combination of A and B. There it is. Coefficient of 899 is minus 6. Coefficient of 493 is 11. And now I win because uh, at the next stage, when we divide 58 by 29, we get a remainder of 0, which tells us that the uh, GCD of, uh, of 58 and 29 is the same as 29. And that means that I've found the coefficients. 29 is the GCD, and so those coefficients for S and T are minus 6 and 11. So this process was discovered in, uh, in medieval India, and there was known as the pulverizer, at least that's the English translation. Um, it's a good dramatic name, who's, uh, the story behind which I don't really know. Okay, one more technical point that we want to work out um, in this segment, and that is that right here, the S is negative and the T is positive. In general, they're going to have to have opposite signs because you usually expect that A and B are bigger than their GCD. So if 
the coefficients of s and, uh, of a and b were the same, the number would be too big or too small. So you expect them to have opposite signs. Well, sometimes you want to have a control of of that the, which coefficient is the positive one. So suppose in this example I had s was negative. The coefficient of a was min of 899 equals a was minus six, and the coefficient of uh, b 493 was uh, was positive. Suppose I wanted to make uh, s positive. Well, there's a simple identity to do that. Notice that if I uh, add a multiple of 493 to the first coefficient, 6, and I add a, 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 and I subtract the corresponding multiple of 899 to the second coefficient, the terms that I've added cancel. So here, I've, uh, to the left-hand term, I've added 493k times 899. And to the right-hand term, I've subtracted 899k times 493. The new blue terms cancel out. And I'm left then with another linear combination of a and b that's equal to the same value as the earlier linear combination, which was the GCD. But now, I, so by I can pump up the co one coefficient by a by a multiple of a, uh, and the other coefficient the, uh, by a multiple of b, as long as it's the same multiple. Any multiple will do, and in that way, I can alter the coefficients, amplify one and decrement the other, and get things to work out. Um, so in particular, here we can just let k be 1. In that case, that's enough to make the left hand um, positive. And uh, so I get that uh, 487 times 899 minus 888 times 493 is also equal to the same GCD 29. And I've gotten s to be positive.